I guess many of us enjoy going out to eat. I know I do. So let me tell you about El Bulli, a restaurant in northern Spain, which was regularly voted the world's finest place to eat. The head chef and proprietor, Ferran Adria, recently opened a research institute and archive which meticulously documented all of the recipes that they've created. Now, if you wanted to eat there, would you want to eat the recipes that they considered successes, the ones that they put into the restaurant, or the ones that were failures, the ones that never made it out of the kitchen? And if you wanted to open a restaurant of your own or learn how to cook, where would you investigate? Would you look at the success pile or the failure pile? Now, if you're one of those people who believes that we learn more from our mistakes than from our successes, you should look at the failure pile. But that strikes me as odd, because all the learning that there is about great food is in this success stack. And we're told in any form of information that there's more learning from failure than success. And this seems to me to be odd. Because when you've created information about anything from flying an aeroplane to building an office block or having a happy relationship, there's more to be learned from our success than our failure. This is a quote from James Dyson. We only ever learn from our failures. He's a brilliant engineer and inventor, and the example that he gave was of a Roman bridge that had stood for more than a thousand years. And he said, to know how strong that bridge is, we would need to stress it to the point where it collapsed. Now that's a very engineering view of failure and success, in which you test something to destruction in order to find out a mathematical figure that's going to be useful for certain circumstances and contexts but it neglects all the success that that bridge has had as a means of conveying people from one side to the other. It's aesthetic beauty, and even in engineering terms, the fact that it has stood for so long. Failure is always relative to context. So if we take the historic project of alchemy, which was to turn lead into gold, that was always doomed to be a failure. But in the context of being a training ground for someone like Isaac Newton, one of the great alchemists, it equipped him with all sorts of skills and abilities for measurement and observation that led to his great discoveries about the laws of physics and gravity. I propose that there's minimal learning from failure. Last year, I failed to write a book. Learning value, to me or anyone else, zero. What I know about learning to write books comes from the times that I've successfully written them. Things like writing a certain quota of words each day and the importance of meeting the deadlines of publishers. And closely related, we also hear the mistakes myth. This says that we can't learn without making mistakes. And it also invites us to embrace our mistakes. Well, up to a point. This first part is wrong. It is possible to learn any process, step by step, whether it's tying a shoelace, playing a piano sonata, or even <coughs> assembling flat pack shelving. It may be unlikely that you get it right first time, but it is, in theory, possible. And the learning that we have, we mostly want to apply a number of times. And in order to do something a second or third time, you have to have done it successfully at least once. So the learning from mistakes is mostly useless learning. You don't need to crash in order to ride a bike. You don't need to break a leg in order to ski, and you don't need to have your business go bankrupt in order to be a successful entrepreneur, asked James Dyson. So why is this myth so prevalent? It does pop up like acne all over the place. 
I went to a seminar at Stanford Design School, one of the world's leading business schools, where they were talking about creativity, saying that it hinged on mistakes. And the one example that they gave was of a child learning to walk through a series of stumbles. But stumbles aren't even mistakes. In the course of learning how to walk, a child is going to adjust from all of the experience it has, picking up the bits that work and putting them into sequences that will enable them to make progress. A mother wouldn't say of her child, my child made a mistake, if the child had simply had a small bump whilst toddling. The same is true in a laboratory. A mistake in that environment would be failing to record data, and a failure would be not finishing their projects on time. But the distinctive thing that goes on in laboratories is experimenting, and that doesn't produce mistakes, that produces information or data or results. Contrast those with a professional environment. I wonder if the proponents of it being okay to make mistakes would submit themselves to a mistake-prone dentist with a drill to their mouth, or to a surgeon with a scalpel, or to a nurse coming along with the wrong drugs. That might lead to some interesting learning for all of us. We get confused by context. A driver making a mistake reading a map leads to inconvenience and maybe an interesting story. A driver making a mistake as an avoider of pedestrians or cyclists leads to tragedy. These contexts of navigation and safety are completely different. And we get confused by language. The opposite of failure is success. You cannot have one concept without the other. It's like light and dark or profit and loss. But that doesn't tell us anything about how the world works. It tells us about how language works. What's the opposite of mistake? Getting it right? There isn't even really a single word for it because it seems so unremarkable and unexceptional as the thing that we do most of the time with most things. Even to say, phew, indicates that you've realized that there was some degree of risk in what you were doing beyond the commonplace. We speak of success when something goes better than expected. Wow, that was a real success. Yet it's mistakes, the things that you're not supposed to do, and usually for a very good reason, that get such a good press. So why is this, and why does it matter? Well, we like drama and stories, and often mistakes and failures are associated with the more interesting and remarkable stories. But that preference can skew in our values and our perceptions. Some examples. There's the mistake that turns out well. You go to the cinema, you sit in the wrong seat. That means you meet somebody fascinating. You get on well, and you've been going out with them ever since. It's a mistake that had a good consequence, but you haven't learned anything about where to sit at cinemas or elsewhere. Then there's the happy accident, the surprise result. You want to invent a strong glue. By mistake, you make a weak glue, so you notice that that works, and you create a post-it note. Alexander Fleming notices that penicillin kills bacteria. He's using his existing skill of being alert to possibilities. What they haven't learned is that it's a good idea to leave the lid off Petri dishes or to have dirty laboratories, which was the original mistake. And then there's the rare occasion when there are only a few possible answers and you can learn something by making the mistakes and arriving at the right answer by the process of elimination. Well, that takes us to the learning level of pigeons in a maze, but most situations in our lives are more complex and more interesting. Another source that feeds this myth is the psychology of mistakes. Let's think about an improvised comedy workshop. In an improvised comedy workshop, you're taught the failure bow with which to greet a mistake, is my friend Ted Smith, demonstrating it beautifully at another TEDx event. And that's fine in an improvisation workshop or similar class where the consequence of an error 
is absolutely inconsequential or minimal. And it's a good idea to reduce the psychological stress of needless perfectionism. It's also why it's a good idea that we no longer beat children in schools for making errors in their schoolwork. It doesn't help the learning. And yet, it has limited application in other parts of life. The psychologists and others also tell us that we learn from our mistakes in life, that they are somehow character forming. And of course, our experience helps us to form our character. But what they usually turn out to be referring to is the counterpart success story associated with that mistake in life, the bouncing back or the resilience. And that's where the valuable learning seems to me to sit. The tennis player, Vitas Gerulaitis, um, played Jimmy Connor and lost to him 16 times in a row. And then they met in the US Open final of 1980. Gerulaitis wins and he announces, nobody beats Vitas Gerulaitis 17 <laughs> times in a row. <laughs> it was an amusing remark, but it conceals the greater truth that success breeds success. And the research bears that out. 60% of tennis players who win the first set go on to win the second set. In any sporting contest that's fairly evenly balanced, you have a winner and a loser. It's the winner that has learned more about winning. The sports managers tell us when they lose, we should look for the positives, which is right. But it's also true of the winners. They too should look at the positives. That's where the learning is. So, what can we conclude? Be clear about the context that you're working in. Keep things in proportion, appropriate to the size of the stakes, and value feedback, your own and others. In a learning environment, treat mistakes lightly as an invitation to have another go and to start to put together the bits that will enable you to get something right and make progress. That's the one useful contribution of the mistakes movement. It's why we invented simulators for pilots who want to learn how to fly or for people who want to conduct safety tests in nuclear power plants. If we make a mistake in an organization, it's worth saying sorry. That will then build trust in you as a manager and it will encourage other people also to admit to mistakes so they can be more quickly put right and correct it. It's most unfortunate, for example, that politicians feel that they can't admit to making mistakes. The stakes for them are too high. And make use of feedback so that you can quickly adapt to what you're doing, using that improvisational sense of noticing what's happening around you and making small adjustments so that you can get onto the course that you want to be <coughs> on and get closer to the goals that you're trying to achieve. And you can learn from other people's mistakes, by which is usually meant some tempting moves that are better for you to avoid to save you time and money and get more quickly onto their success stack, which is what made them worthwhile mentors to you in the first place, the things that they succeeded in doing. These are strange times. We hold on to this myth of mistakes and failure. And we're searching for tiny scraps of learning in that failure file. And in another time, another place, we could put our attention much more on what works and what goes well and look into that success stack and learn to learn from our successes. And in that endeavor, I wish you every success. <laughs>